has helped me in a hospital board. Thank congratulations. You. Thank you. Congratulations. And don't look any different. But congratulations. <laughs> you should. Yeah. Congratulations. So this morning, um, we have a presentation from the Los Altos Stage Company. And it, it, who knew it was going to be this timely because the city has just released some of the potential downtown development or scenarios. And uh, the idea of a downtown theater figures fairly prominently in some of those scenarios. So our, our your presentation this morning is, is actually more timely than we thought. So that's great. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically just turn it over to you folks to talk a little bit about the needs of the company, how the company operates, the endowments, and so forth. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you have them, if you wish. Um, but um, anyway, to kind of give us the, the, the background and the lay of the land of the company, because I think there's many of us, including me, who really don't understand the operational challenges and needs of, of the company. So with that, I will turn it over to the two of you. Thank you. Oh, oh good morning. Hopefully this will work. So I've been involved with the Los Altos Stage Company uh, since it start, was started in, well, there's been a theater in the, in the building for a long time, but the Los Altos Stage Company changed its name from Bus Barn Stage Company 23 years ago. So in that period, that's how long I've been doing things. Uh, can you back up to the one that shows the building? Let's see if I can. <laughs> I just want you to notice the structure that we are in. This is a city on, it was actually built by the school district in, on school district land originally, and it's a metal butler building, it's called. It was built in the 40s, and you can see the big door, that's slides. And so in the back, we're facing, that's the back of the building, and, and there's a scene shot back in there that's full of stuff. Okay, that's good enough. And you, can, you can watch how many times you see either Gary's face or my face in these photos. Uh, but in the 70s, there was a group called Los Altos Conservatory Theater, a man who was a drama teacher at Foothill College, Doyne Moraz. Some of you may have known Doyne, who was a huge character. And he built a, he got permission from the city to put a theater inside this. The city by then owned this little structure, bought the land and the building from the school district. And so there's been a theater, a live theater in Los Altos for over 40 years. And uh, LACT got closed down in the 80s. Was yeah. Early 90s. Uh, maybe early 90s. It ran out. It, it, it ex overextended itself. Charged things on a credit card. Didn't have any money to pay for that. And we shut them down. But that was about the time the Los Altos Community Foundation be became in a thing. And Roy Lave was very interested in that. And he said, "I'm going to start a foundation. We're going to give money. We're going to keep a theater." And it all. Vicki, would you please help me? And so uh, this is a slide from our show, Urine Challenge, a, a, a fun musical about the future when there's not enough water. Um, okay. So then, uh, the Bus Barn Stage Company, which is Los Altos Stage Company, then with Vicki and Roy and a number of other community members was uh, constituted about 1995. Mm -hmm. uh, so taking over the space with a different arrangement with the city than the previous organization had. But pretty much other than a, probably a year right. lapse of programming, uh, continued the programming. So since the mid-70s, there's been continual programming in this building, which this building was back in the 50s, was it? The, <coughs> which one? The, the bus barn itself. A, the 40s. The 40s. So it's been there. Since the, and, it, and, it, and it's relatively, even in the 40s, a, a, a temporary structure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not, it is a concrete slab right. and a tin building, but it was not really intended as a, as a, as a permanent uh, structure. But the inside looks pretty cool. The inside is very good. I mean, it was all built by Doyne Mraz and his buddies, and they put in a built stage, built, found uh, old used theater seats. So there's great seating, there's great visibility. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's, just, so, go ahead. yeah it's, a, it's an intimate space. Uh, so it says, uh, currently we do five uh, plays in, in our kind of a, adult uh, season each year. Um, that's varied from year to year, uh, five to six, and over the years we've also introduced uh, youth theater shows. Uh, so between five and six shows uh, a season, roughly from September to June, um, occasionally summer youth production, uh, and roughly uh, 8,000 direct patrons for the shows, and then including the other program, about 10,000 uh, people a year uh, engaging with the organization. Cool. We usually do two musicals and uh, three dramas, and our tickets uh, range, as you can see. It's pretty, compared to what you have to pay to go see Hamilton, my gosh, <laughs> you can come to, you can buy several season tickets to our show, and uh, uh, this is the Fantastics, which we did about 
five years five years ago. So. Yep. Yeah. We do share the space with the, the city owns the building, we don't pay rent. Mm -hmm. um, we pay you sharing the, the, the cost of utilities, yeah, and yeah. we do share the space with Los Altos Youth Theater, and, and people are always confused. Oh, I came to see one of your plays, it was Alice in Wonderland, well, that's the youth theater, but it's done, that's managed by the rec department, but that's about to change. We are we have been negotiating with the rec department to, that we're gonna take over the management of, and the blend our two groups together eventually. I think about uh, four years ago, we started doing partnerships with the Los Altos uh, Youth Theater, uh, doing uh, joint productions in the summer where adult actors and youth actors would come together and put on shows for families. Um, based on that, we had started building uh, additional education programs, uh, classes for youth, um, uh, site-specific kind of youth productions outside um, at the History Museum, uh, summer camps, and hopefully the discussions with the city and, and the ultimate kind of bringing the other organizations, then that will kind of both advance both organizations' kind of educational needs. So, this is how many seats we have. There was some uh, reason about 99 instead of 100, some, well, we aren't even sure if it's yeah. still, is it still a deal? With no, the, the original thought about 99 came, came out of a, 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 the, Union for Actors, Actors Equity uh, down in Los Angeles, and they were thinking about expanding it to, to other areas. There was an equity waiver contract where uh, union performers could perform in non-union houses as long as the seats were under 99 seats. Um, that actually doesn't exist up in the Bay Area anymore, and, and, and they're trying to get it, rid of it in Los Angeles, so it doesn't impact contracts. Eventually, uh, organizations that do form contracts with Actors' Equity, size of the seats comes into the, uh, size of the house comes into the negotiation about how much uh, is the minimum weekly uh, pay that, that union actors have to uh, be paid. So we do out, uh, run about 80% full. And uh, this picture here, so this slide is of our last September's musical. It's a hilarious story musical about killing U.S. presidents called Assassins by Stephen Sondheim. Right. It was very well done. And there was humor. Yeah. The, the total, uh, depending on the number of shows, uh, each show's attendance runs from, for straight plays, roughly between 1,100 to 1,300 uh, people coming to see a straight play. Musicals range roughly from about 1,400 to 2,000 people coming to see um, musicals. So the capacity for straight plays uh, it ends up being slightly less and, and musicals slightly more. Um, but for the last five years, the, the average capacity has hit about 80%. So, Gary is half of our staff. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, I am not a paid, I'm the president of the board, and people say, oh, are you paid? I say, no, I'm paid. <laughs> I work for free and then I pay. And I'm happy to do it. This has been a wonderful experience for me. Uh, uh, we have, Gary has an associate artistic director that's part-time, and we do have contract employees. Maybe you can talk a little bit about right, the staffing structure. So yeah. the staffing structure uh, is myself uh, with the executive artistic director, so I span over all the tasks, both on the business side uh, and the artistic side. An associate artistic director who deals primarily with uh, production and artist relations, so staff relations and, and uh, auditions and staffing of shows. Um, a part-time right now education director, which will shift over to a, to a hopefully uh, to a full-time position, who will deal with the youth education programs and the classes and summer camps. Uh, a part-time uh, box office manager who uh, deals with ticket sales, uh, and then all the other staff is contracted. We we contract a little over a hundred um, actors, directors, choreographers, scenic designers, sound designers, light designers. Uh, on a show by show um, basis. We uh, have a pretty large pool of people we work with and we try to keep that pool large rather than kind of narrow it down to a few uh, people who are going on all the shows. We try to uh, expand that pool and, and have a diversity of people come in, both on the performance side but also on the directing and the senior <coughs> uh, side of the organization. Uh, all of the people involved with the uh, productions are paid a stipend. Uh, so the actors, even though the actors currently now are, are non-union, uh, they're paid a stipend that is uh, competitive and in most cases higher than all organizations that are similar sized organizations to us 
um, around the, the area, if you know any of the others, Pear Theater, Dragon Theater, City Lights Theater, those are kind of our contemporary uh, peer organizations. Uh, and uh, all of the production personnel are also paid stipend uh, to be involved. So uh, no, the only volunteers for the organization, the board is volunteer, uh, ushers who see the show are volunteer, uh, but everyone else involved in production is, is paid some form of stipend to be involved. But you need a day job. But you do. <laughs> it's, it, it, right now we've been, the, the, the pay for the production personnel it, it is, it's competitive, it's obviously it's not up to the level of the union houses of, of Theater Works or ACT or Berkeley Rep, but it is competitive within um, our peer organizations. Um, the actor stipend, the board committed four years ago to, to incrementally and kind of responsibly increasing the actor stipend. Uh, and our goal is ultimately get, to get everybody to the equity has a non-equity minimum. So, Shows that you see at Theater Works and at SET have have a lot of union, but also have a lot of non-union. Those non-union are paid a different minimum uh, stipend to be involved in the show. Our goal is to get our stipend up to that minimum non-union uh, before we start engaging with union contracts uh, to do that. So I think that's that. Yeah. So this is where we get philosophical. Uh, that it, you know, going to the theater is different than uh, watching a movie at your house or at well, movie theater. No, I say it's still different. That that you know, it, uh, it's it's meant to stimulate and provoke you. And some we, we have a lot of debates on our board because well, let's just and you're probably thinking, well, if musicals bring in more people, why don't you just do five musicals? And you know, um, well, we're trying to do more than just entertain you. We're trying to, to engage you. And so uh, this is a production we did last year called Yellow Face, which had a very predominantly Asian American cast, which was exciting and different for us, and it was an interesting story about Yellow Face is an expression like blackface, meaning you know portraying another ethnicity besides your own, and the, the what was it the controversy back in the '90s of hiring Caucasians to play Asian parts and like you know, this Saigon and things like that. The, the goals across from show to show vary uh, as far as what we're trying to uh, achieve with them. And, and we are looking over, definitely over the course of the season, but even longer than the season, about what type of mix of, of productions uh, we're presenting, uh, both so that we can try to appeal to, to a broad audience with very differing uh, desires um, for, for what they want when they come to see theater, uh, but also to be uh, responsive to, to contemporary issues that are going on, to be responsive to what the trends are going on within the theater community now, uh, to be responsive to the theater community artists uh, that exist in the community and what are their concerns and issues and what things are they interested uh, in exploring. Um, so we, it's uh, it's a challenge to, per, to uh, one show can't do everything. Um, and so very often it doesn't and so we do make decisions about trying to balance out shows that are explicitly about uh, being entertaining and, and being escape with shows that are much more about uh, exploring form or exploring language or shows that are about trying to uh, spark a conversation about something that may be going out in the community that we're interested in sparking that conversation. Uh, so over the course of a season, and definitely over the course of two seasons, you'll see an ebb and flow to the types of works that are going on. <laughs> so we do want to poke people just a little bit. Gently. Not everyone likes that. And there are people that uh, don't really come to the theater to be uh, prodded and to be awakened, and they come to be, uh, you know, hear pretty songs sung to them, I guess. And, and uh, but. We know sharing, sharing stories is the oldest, I mean, human activity we, we have ever engaged in and we continue to engage in, I would say. It's been a, it's been a part of being a, a, upright on our feet and walking around and getting out of the cave uh, since then. And it hasn't really gone away as a useful form of, of engaging together. So, it's, you know, the Greeks did it, you know, the Romans did it. It was a big deal. Uh, but now we're competing with, everyone has their own entertainment in their hand. And uh, as you notice walking around anywhere, that people can't even walk anymore without 
constantly. I thought, what is in there? What can you possibly be looking at? <laughs> that, you know. And going and sitting in the dark and, and, and being willing to be open to new experiences is, is getting more difficult to uh, pull people out of their cozy home entertainment centers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So what are we doing right now? This is a scene from uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which is a successful show we did last year. Um, and uh, this is our starting our 22nd season. It's opening in three weeks. September 7th. Yeah. Gary, among his executive director duties, he's building the set. Uh, and uh, we, so we have one, and usually there's two shows that, that we have. You do use a room at Hillview Community Center, a classroom, and we have one rehearsal going on in there for the upcoming show, the November show, and then we have uh, <coughs> rehearsals going on on our stage. So it gets complicated when you think, oh, well, we can just build a theater, and we can have all these different groups share it. And, it's yes you can but you need to make it be a bigger theater and have some kind of revolving stage or, or doors that can be closed but there you have to think through how you can share space because it's challenging to practice on the actual set you're going to use mm -hmm. and yeah over the course of a year um even though our season generally is from uh, september to june we're, we're operating a year around and at any given point we're working on probably three shows at, at different stages. Um, right now, Vicki said, we're, we've been rehearsing for the opening show of the season, The Crucible. We're right now, for the past four weeks, we've been constructing the set in the, in the scene shop, and, and now we're moving that set into the theater itself and placing it in there. The actors are rehearsing on that stage. We're having the initial production meeting now for the second show, which will be 1940s Radio Hour, and that will shortly be starting rehearsals over in 15 while Crucible is on the set, and then we'll move over uh, into the theater uh, in uh, early November. Um, we're, we're just having callbacks now for the third show, which is 1984, which will open in, in January, and we're putting now out the auditions for the fourth show, uh, of the season which will be distracted. So there's a constant kind of rotation of shows just to do the five shows. And as we add additional programs and additional shows, obviously that will tighten that cycle. So at any time, we'll, we'll be putting our hands on three shows at a time, uh, which is uh, it's a, it's an interesting balancing act. Most of the production staff and the actors do one project at a time. Come into a project, <laughs> do that project, finish that project, and then move on to the next. The organizations themselves are always rotating uh, within a project, so having to kind of shift focus uh, um, constantly is, is, is one of the main challenges of the organization, both within resources and how you kind of allocate resources, both space and personnel and, and finances, but definitely also just mind space to keep moving from one artistic project to the next. Did I mention Gary's actually acting in the crucible? <laughs> oh, After he builds it. And then the Follies is the fundraiser show that I do. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But so we're also rehearsing. So we are fitting ourselves in, you know, to room 15 when they're not, and you know, into the theater when they're not. So it's all very exciting. Yeah, and uh, the our focus over the last two years has really been about uh, expanding our youth education programs. Um, prior, I, I came onto the organization uh, a little over five years ago, and uh, the organization's education programs were um, one-offs, mostly here or there, and there have been different efforts over the course of the year, but not in any kind of sustained, uh, long-term way. And to do that, um, the board um, and I made the decision that youth education was a really important component of the organization, to, to build a robust organization, uh, and also to help the organization touch uh, more people within the Los Angeles community, that there was a big uh, segment of the community that we weren't engaging with uh, around families and around youth. Um, and that order, in order to, to really uh, strengthen our position in the organization and, and expand um, our relevancy to the community, we needed to, to focus on this. So our first efforts were really about partnerships with the Los Angeles Youth Theater, um, the sense that rather than create something that was either competitive or uh, that was duplicative, um, that we should first try to do it in partnership. And so we did a number of shows with them. Um, and then as we did those, we saw areas that uh, weren't being covered by the Los Altos Youth Theater, specifically around workshops and camps and skill-based uh, activities. Uh, so we started expanding programming around that. Uh, and uh, then because space is such an issue 
for us we put a lot of soft tissue theater there's only one theater and there really can only be for the most part one thing in there at a time um, we looked towards providing youth with opportunities to do pop-up theater uh, theater in non-traditional spaces uh, we were kind of hoping and looking for uh, spaces in the downtown area that were currently being used that we could quickly adapt to a pop-up theater you know bring it up in a month and take it down quickly um, we still are very interested in doing that. I think that for youth would be a great experience to be able to kind of go into a space that wasn't intended to be a theater, be able to have the experience of transforming it into a performance space, kind of controlling their own artistic creation and then moving out of the space is really something we want to do. What we ended up doing for our pilot though was, was doing an outdoor performance over in the uh, history uh, museums uh, courtyard uh, with youth was with their first experience. Um, great. Yeah, it worked out really well. So we're continuing to look at this, and right now we finished summer camps this summer for ages four um, up to 18. Uh, we had seven different camps, ranging from kind of dramatic play camps up to skill-based acting uh, and musical theater camps. Um, we're looking forward to both expanding those programs that are piloted uh, and completing our conversations with the uh, recreation department uh, around the next steps for uh, Los Altos State and the Los Altos Youth Theater. Um, and once we uh, build on that partnership, then we'll have a greater ability to kind of see what other programs kind of fit uh, within that and support that. So I think we've already talked about all this stuff, but building out, I mean, one of the reasons you need youth is you need their parents. And if you just rely on the little old ladies who like to go to matinees on Sunday, eventually they get too old to get in their car and come to the matinee anymore. And uh, if you go to theater, you tend to walk in and go, oh my God, these people are old. And uh, uh, so, you know, uh, you've been there, I can tell you. So you, to build an audience, you really need to engage with your entire community. And you have to, getting the kids involved is one of the way that's been most successful. And finding donors. I mean, you just, again, those little old ladies that gave all that money and that show the producers where they just keep sleeping with the little old ladies to get their money. That's, that's a little successful for the so far. Yeah. We, yeah. I mean, try to reach out broader than that. Yeah. Yeah. The education program and the youth, and the adult, the, 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 the goal of the organization is, is really to expand its involvement, uh, involvement in, the, in the ecology of the, of, of, of the community. To, to, to build audiences from being able to tap into people from a young age through their life cycle within the community and the ways that they interact with them. So from down to early youth uh, programs, teen programs, interacting with the parents around those programs, transitioning the parents from interacting with the education programs into, into within the adult programs, moving the teens from working within the, the youth programs to working when we're doing it right now when uh, one actress who comes out of Los Altos Youth Theater is actually playing within the Crucible, so providing them opportunities to transition from the youth theater shows to the adult shows and then just keep filtering people through. If, if unfortunately, if, if organizations focus on um, really just the needs of a small group of subscribers who are very loyal or very important to the organization, but that group itself, as that group starts to age, it starts to shrink. Uh, and without feeding the organization, you find yourself in a position down the road uh, where you don't have the people filling in uh, underneath in the same degrees. Uh, and that's really where organizations have historically gotten themselves uh, into trouble. And so we're trying to uh, shift that. I like this picture. This is from Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Another happy family story. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was a very funny it, it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Tom Goff is actually a local guy who grew up, I think, in local theater and teaches from a foothill and acted his pants off as the husband in this particular show. But we really are trying to build deep connections between the artists and the audience. That it's not just come in, see a show, walk out the door, forget what you saw. Yeah, but go home and think about it and talk to somebody about it and uh, ponder whether this has any, I mean, it's, you can see people get, are, are affected by what they see on the stage. And it's interesting to me because I see most of our shows two or three times, Gary sees them way many more times than that, but it's different every time. I mean, you can go one night and see it and it'll affect you one way and then you can go back another time and you see different things and you feel a different way. So uh, 
Definitely. Yeah. For those of you who haven't been in our space, um, it is an incredibly intimate space, even with 99 seats. Uh, many times the actors are only a few feet away from um, from the audience. And so that experience of what's going on is substantially different than you have in the larger houses where you kind of see a shape of somebody, <laughs> uh, but you're not necessarily right there uh, within the experience that they're doing. And, and many of the shows that we do and the approaches to the show take that intimacy into consideration, uh, both in the selection of shows and what shows work within that intimate setting, but also in the reimagining shows that typically people have experienced within larger um, venues or larger productions. Um, we did three years ago, uh, I think, uh, Man of La Mancha, which typically people experience as a large scale uh, production. Uh, we felt that that production had a lot uh, of uh, had an emotional quality that could benefit from making it wider, making it smaller, making it more um, direct to the audience. Um, that the that the emotions in the show would be heightened um, by making a having a softer approach to it, having a big kind of bombastic approach. And it did. It, uh, it it was a different way for experience, people to experience something that they may have already been familiar with, but in a much kind of uh, more intimate, quiet, more introspective type of. Uh, approach. The, uh, in addition to kind of the goals about deep connections within the artists and the audiences, the goals of the organization also to form uh, deeper connections with other community organizations. Um, we've been building relationships with the History Museum, furthering relationships with Boat Hill College, uh, and trying to figure out ways that, that our goals can overlap, um, both in the sense of we have limited resources. So the more partnerships and the more relationships that we're able to tap into, the farther we can spread our own resources. But it's also theater um, is a community, and to, to be able to develop those relationships and filter people back and forth has been uh, helpful to us in, in bringing the best talent that we can find within the community, but also helpful to those people uh, outside of the community to expand the places that they're able to interact with audiences. So you might be asking, why don't we just you know raise the ticket prices to cover? But there is no theater that does not have about this uh, uh, fifty percent uh, ticket. It doesn't matter what the ticket costs. Uh, the expenses are double, <laughs> and uh, and our budget, as you can see, is pretty tiny. And uh, so we do a lot of we have to do a lot of fundraising and uh, grant writing, and there is no grant writer except for Gary. And, uh, <laughs> You know, there is no fundraiser except for Vicky and the Gary. Um, but anyway, we can go on. <laughs> we don't need to believe that's just the facts. That's why they're screaming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's actually not why they were. They, they were being discovered in a torrid affair or something yeah. like that. That's what yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and just to give you a point of reference, like when I came on four years ago, the, the budget was roughly about $300,000. Yeah. So, over that course, so we're doing good. Yeah. About $100,000. Musicals cost more than straight plays, as you can see, about forty thousand to produce versus twenty three thousand and six thousand in marketing, which is mainly advertising, a paper, you know, newspaper print and posters and you know the classic things. Um, musicals are fun, but we have to have a band or you have to have a track. We've never really done a musical with no. a track, but but uh, you know, musicians expect to be paid too. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. It ends up the the uh, we. They said the musicals cost about twice as much as the um, as the straight plays. They generate about equally as much income, so the net ends up being pretty close to the same. Musicals net sometimes are, is a little bit more, um, and and the likelihood of musical doing on the better end is a little bit higher than straight plays. Straight plays are a little bit more unknown as far as they're going to perform. But the net net ends up being about the same, and, and the average print on musicals is, is substantially more as far as on the production side. The number of people that are engaged um, to do. Oh, Gary's actually in this picture. You can see if you can figure out which one of those. <laughs> those body, those people having a shared community experience right there on the stage, which they actually did. It was all about you know this uh, play called Circle Mirror Transformation we did last year about an acting class, and they kept having to lie down and count the yeah, yeah. and they not get it right. Uh, so we think that it's a valuable thing to have a live theater in our town, and that, that the shared community experience is worth 
uh, us continuing to do this kind of work and that we get a lot out of it and we hope that uh, the community does too. And uh, this is a, us, me being a butterfly last year. We often have an endangered species song of some sort when we do the follies, which is a, our, it's a musical parody show that we do every October. And it's been done since, actually started back when it was LACT at the very end. It was, or when the city of Los Altos actually had its 40th anniversary, somehow somebody had the idea we should put on a little show at the theater. And so that was sort of the start of the follies. And, uh, John Sylvester there was the scientist telling the sad story about why the butterflies are dying. Nancy Clay. Nancy Clay's uh Wilson Los Altos is the Carrie Young, uh, Gordon Abraham. I'll go. Yeah. You can go on. <laughs> we were adorable. Uh, the, the, the topics we tend to cover are current, and so that religion, sex, and politics <laughs> and uh, community kerfuffles. We haven't had that's enough kerfuffles. Yeah. <laughs> this, is two, this picture is from two years ago. <laughs> it seems so hilarious then. <laughs> uh, yeah. And like, oh, well, this won't do us any good in the future. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah. Um, so this the show will be in October, October 5th, 6th, and 7th. And we don't have too many. We aren't making too much fun of Los Altos. Oh, <laughs> um, sorry, you guys haven't been, you know, that's not funny. enough. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> we do have a song called All Night Long. About, <laughs> about, it's about both the council running on and the complaining citizens in this lovely place. What have they got to complain about? <laughs> Them running on. That's good. Okay. Yeah. So this, I like this picture. This is from the Follies a few years ago. This is one of the songs we did about the downtown. We are all channeling our parents. And this is our attitude about we don't want to change at all. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, you can tell by our expressions that we, we had no trouble doing this song. <laughs> so then, when Gary talked about working with the museum, and we do have a, uh, the ability in our theater to show. Uh, we have a big screen and a projector in them, so we can show uh, presentations to, for other groups on, on occasion but we're not in there which is like Mondays <laughs> and uh, so it's been very nice to be able to work with them this is from that, that, that show is from a one called Dead Man's Cell Phone also and here we are here we are making Los Altos some more vibrant place to live we do think we do that and then we contribute to you know all these actors and contract people who come work for us you know Need a place to go get a sandwich or whatever, and we cannot provide food. And uh, uh, and they like to, you know, actors like to go out finding a place to go out to have a drink after a show in Los Altos. That's very challenging. Okay. And uh, just to be clear, the, the uh, audience breakdown uh, of yeah. Los Altos residents uh, and Los Altos Hills residents are about sixty percent of the audience. So forty percent of the audience comes from that side uh, of Los Altos. Uh, the primary places people are coming from. Mountain View, Palo Alto, San Jose uh, are the, probably the biggest ones, Cupertino, uh, Sunnyvale, uh, in that order. But then, and that represents uh, about 20% of that. But at other 20% people are coming down from San Francisco, from the East Bay, and from Santa Cruz, oh. over. Um, our audience, it, it varies depending on the size of the show, but it's about 30% of subscribers. Uh, about 30% are kind of general audience member ticket buyers about 30% are connected to the artists and production people um, to do the, the artists themselves bring their relations and their uh, connections here to Los Altos uh, to see it. Many over the last five years are first time uh, people, about 20% of our audience is first time people who haven't been to Los Altos, haven't been to the Los Altos Theater before. So theater does drive uh, people coming to experience be introduced both to the community center but also to the community of Los Altos. And I'm always blown away that actors will come. I mean, it's like six weeks of rehearsal every night, or five nights, five to six nights a week, plus five to six weeks of performances from Wednesday to Sunday. And people will live in Santa Rosa and commute and act at our theater. Mm -hmm. So people that want to do this really want to do it. Yeah. The Bay Area is a really active performing arts community. Uh, definitely the men's on the South Bay is incredibly active in the number of organizations um, that are presenting. Actually, the, the pool of artists and and production personnel, uh, it is stretched very thin over the number of opportunities um, for them to present. Um, you know, within a 25 mile radius of Los Alamos, again, you have Parrot Theater, you have Silicon Valley Shakespeare, you have Dragon Theater, you have Broadway by the Bay, you have City Theater, San Jose Stage, Sunnyvale Community Players, West Valley Opera, um, 
it, the number goes on and on and on. And to do that, and, and Los Alamos State Bus Farm uh, has been an important central part of that for the last 22 yeah. years and, and before. So before we move on, I just want to point out the guy in the blue shirt with the straw hat back there in the back row behind me is Rod Sinks. He's on the city council, uh, uh, <laughs> and he's been a stalwart member of our show for a long time. The, the, all the men in this picture are wearing my shirts. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> my jewelry. <laughs> that was just a little silent. <laughs> so, what do we need over there? If you haven't been in there, I mean, we talked a little bit about it being a metal building and on a <laughs> cement slab, but uh, there's no restrooms. We share the restrooms, out the outdoor restrooms next door with the playing field people, so with little kids. So you can imagine how lovely they are to go into at 8 o'clock at night. And they're not bad, but they're also not heated. So, um, uh, we, the theater lights, some of the, we've replaced a lot of the lights. We've done a lot of stuff. We've recovered the seats. We've all at our expense, not the city's expense. And uh, But there's constant need to upgrade. And, and every year when the fire marshal comes, we sort of hold our breath and make sure that everything's OK with him. Um, you know, so anything else you want to add? I mean, I mean we don't basically. have a lobby. Yeah. I mean, primarily, the, the space that we exist in and have been existing for 40 years is, is what, in theory, you consider a found space. Um, it, it's a space that was never intended to, to be a theater that has been transformed into a theater and, and has done some incredible work within that. Um, but it, it does not necessarily, um, as the community, and, and that was you know, 40 years ago that kind of transformation happened. And as this community has changed, as the desires of the community has changed, the needs of the community has changed, the theaters may, have to maintain the, the relatively the same uh, in, in the way it's operating. So there are, is a large portion of this uh, community that's not accessing the theater now, not because of the quality of the productions, but because of the quality of the experience within the space. It's just not a, uh, a space that some people will come to um, and have to go outside and to, to bathrooms, or will come to uh, because of the nature of the external uh, perceptions of the building. It's a space that, for many people, they have to overcome their issues or challenges or perceptions of the building in order to get inside and, and then many of those people are surprised by the experience they have but for those of you who know being a surprise is a, is a challenge it, it, it's, you have to you have to overcome people's perceptions it's not a, a benefit to the organization to have to overcome uh, people's negative perceptions uh, from the existing space uh, so that's a challenge in building audiences where we could otherwise we think, well, Los Altos has so many people in culture and education and support, and yes, and a good portion of them will go to theater groups, will go to other spaces, will go to spaces that are more reflective of how they perceive their status or their experiences within their lives. And the goal of, of a theater in Los Altos should be to, to get the experience more in line uh, with the community's uh, perception of themselves. So, this is a musical we did a couple years ago, another Sondheim show. It was a great company. Company. Um, I would like to make sure that you understand our point is that we, we are totally, we're going to talk about downtown theater now. But uh, in order for us to be, we want to be totally, we're totally into it, and we want to be involved in whatever happens with moving a theater downtown. But for that to be the case, I really want to encourage all of you to be enthusiasts and supporters of the theater we have now that, as you can see, we could use more of you in every way, you know, it's just as customers, just come see our shows, come be a subscriber, you know, write a check, it all will help. So uh, let's just go on now and talk a little bit about it. Um, so uh, hopefully just quickly, the, 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 obviously the process of, of a downtown theater um, and the discussion has been going on for quite some time, and, and we have been open and interested in talking to everybody and anybody who's interested in, in putting forward their thoughts about um, what should happen in the future of theater. Uh, so the, the different projects of the last four years that we've been involved in, um, many of them kind of, uh, led by King Lear, um, have, have been around the, the thoughts of moving the theater into downtown, not necessarily about rehabilitating the existing theater or staying within the existing kind of community center, but, but about uh, are there ways and interests around downtown. And the, and the two um, ideas that came out of that were uh, one about the possibility of looking at a space over on Third Street, um, in between Los Altos Grill and uh, the Chase Bank in the parking lot, and uh, another about the possibility of looking at a, at a space 
uh, over on First Street. And those were the two that had been floated around it. So we're just kind of presenting that information to you. Um, for those of you who haven't already heard about those different kind of discussions that were going on. The initial discussion uh, around the theater over on 3rd Street, uh, King Lear with us and a number of other, I uh, think Mary was at the meetings originally, uh, Ginny Bruins, got together and we were brainstorming with some architects what some goals and objectives would be and what um, kind of putting numbers to paper uh, in a quick uh, way. The goals really were about bringing uh, programs to downtown, about providing versatile theater that could handle music and theater as well as um, uh, of course, the community is interested in, in, in film programming um, to provide an updated, up to date facility both for the youth theater uh, and for the Los Altos, uh, Los Altos stage and then sustainable design. Uh, I think this got cut off, but basically, the, the original concept that was being proposed during these kind of conversations was somewhere around 160 seat theater, not really looking to expand to a large theater, but keeping something kind of appropriately sized for the community and still within that uh, intimate quality uh, for the theater, uh, for the uh, for the community. And the original concept was a space that was around 12,000 square feet. Uh, this was just kind of the breakdown and the concept meetings of, of what 12,000 square feet would be able to do uh, with rehearsal space, classroom, uh, a, a stage with a proscenium, an auditorium that it said it's a flexible from 165 to 180 seats, dressing rooms, orchestra pits, the different kind of rooms that were needed. Yep. What is the current uh, square feet? Uh, 10,000. Mm -hmm. And this is not, this is this is floor plan square feet, not, uh, mm -hmm. obviously not mm -hmm. vertical. Uh, this building would have a greater vertical. Right now, uh, so the vertical and right now in the building, the height is it varies because the building is pitched. <laughs> so it goes from nine feet over on one side to 14 feet. Um, so you can imagine uh, what that does for productions and lighting. It takes us three times as many lights uh, to light the space uh, on stage as it does for other theaters who actually have twice the height. It takes fewer lights to light higher up than it does close down just because of the angles of the, of the lights. Um, so, these were the, so these are the things that you all just saw, just to, to give you an idea. This was uh, the one where the original uh, concept, it was like three years ago in yeah. conversations, was about the third street spot and about looking at an idea for combined parking structure and theater building within the third street uh, between uh, the grill and Chase Bank. Um, the one that conversation that has more recently uh, come about was a concept of uh, integrating with uh, Los Altos community investments, desires for green space, and seeing if there might be a way to, to partner with that concept. And that's where uh, this other concept about putting a theater on First Street it, in relation to the green space uh, idea that they were looking at. Uh, putting there on Third Street. This one, which I didn't know, also kept the idea for the movie theater, which I think would be a great idea. Yeah. That, the, the idea of having a, a joint theater and movie theater is an interesting idea that can be uh, worked out. It definitely increases costs in construction to create a, a flexible space, and it also creates, uh, obviously, uh, challenges around space use and program. Mm -hmm. uh, the needs of theaters and needs of movie theaters um, can often collide, and so the way that those programs are integrated really has to be thought out. Otherwise, my experience with organizations that have done that is they start the program and then that program goes away uh, because of the, the challenges about coordinating uh, overwhelm the organization uh, to do that. So um, this was from the first street, uh, converse, no, third street conversations back three years ago uh, when they kind of just put some numbers down, and we're looking at the hard costs of building the theater over uh, next to uh, Los Altos Grill at roughly about $8 million. And then these were the uh, original kind of whys about what a downtown theater would bring. Uh, that it could uh, leverage the daytime appeal of downtown uh, Los Altos. Uh, <coughs> the venue would be attracted to customers from surrounding cities. That there's history of success, that there's no real competition uh, within Los Altos area, such a type of organization. It was the original concept was the combined revenues from the youth theater and the community theater 
uh, together with rental, the movies would be able to handle the operation and maintenance costs uh, for building going forward. Uh, and then the idea that the giving entertainment was listed as a priority in the downtown design plan uh, as it would support uh, the success of the businesses uh, surrounding it. So I think that was. I think we're done. Yep. We have time for questions if you have questions or comments. Well, I do have a question. Um, I'm on a community center task force. Right. And one of the questions I have for you is on the assumption that the community center redevelopment proceeds, what's your thinking about interim accommodation of the scene shop and the rehearsal space that you're currently using? So the scene shop's part of the existing theater, so it's within that. So it's it shouldn't be, theater. yeah, so it shouldn't be. Rehearsal space will be an issue uh, that, that we'll have to figure out. Um, and we, we don't have an answer to that yet, but once so again, sit down. But uh, we've had the initial conversations of, oh, and be prepared, <laughs> but we haven't kind of had the next conversations of, okay, what does be prepared look like yeah. Yeah. to do? Thank David and then Gary. Okay, so we you know where my questions come from. Yeah, from the <laughs> library theater. This is hypothetical. And I've talked to Gary about this before. Um, the block that you it, it, the shared space right without deteriorating for what the theater needs which is a lot of the space in the room. but what is it physically you have to do so and i'll just give you so movies lectures uh, uh, a, a space that becomes an auditorium you know like you can make it into an open space so the library has use of it but your space is dedicated so it's a theater what physically do you have to do with the building to make it both work together? For, yeah, it depends on the program mix. I mean, both of the a combination within a, a library theater has its own challenges as opposed to, are you, are you just talking about a movie, movie, movie to live performance or are you talking about? Movie else? and lecture. Movie and lecture, really the, the, the biggest challenge about movie and lecture is being able to close off the, the stage, um, to be able to construct a space that has a large enough apron uh, in front of the proscenium and the ability, but most theaters have the ability to, to have a shop behind the stage and to close off that shop. And it would lock both sound wise and dust wise and everything to be able to close it. To be able to, to function with a, with a uh, to still have the rehearsals and the other things that need to go on on the stage, you would need to be able to do the same thing to the front part of the proscenium and basically close it off in a way that whatever's happening on the stage doesn't have an impact on the Okay. Uh, on the movie theater itself, the, so that's a structural, you know, but challenge in order to do that. It's doable. It is doable. Uh, it is a challenge. It's not the biggest challenge. The, the bigger challenge is about uh, pro programming and scheduling and when programming happens. Theater is uh, an incredibly um, met, up, up to the time that the audience comes in and sees the production. It's an incredibly messy form. Uh, it, it, it dominates the space. It, it creates an incredible amount of kind of chaos and dirt, and that gets cleaned up at the end. But it impacts the entire okay. theater uh, to do it while you're installing and building. It's basically that you're building a small house every couple of weeks on a, on a stage. Yeah, I hope you noticed all those slides. I mean, how, what, how we can transform that space, I think, is quite spectacular. So, so how you keep that from impacting the theater space um, so that you can have. Uh, people doing it is a big challenge. The other is just the type, the days at which people see movies and the days at which people see theater are generally the same um, overall, larger audiences. So, what type of movies and what type of programming do you do that can be um, complementary to those theater days and not competitive with those theater days, and which people are discovering the the distributors of those films, the more bigger, more popular uh, films have to have those dates. It is more the film series, the film programs, the more independent films that would be more interested in being programmed around. And so you have to figure out how that works. Gary. Uh, just a comment to uh, reassure you that there is a lot of support for live theater in this area. Uh, Pat and I have been going to the New Works <coughs> Festival this past week and uh, yeah. Lucy Stern and five plays in six days. So it's, it's, it's exhausting but exciting. Did you see Jeffrey Lowe's, uh, the small one, the reversal one? Uh, 
Oh, well, I don't mm. Yeah, it was a smaller one. It was an ADC. Uh, he, he was no, it's Lucy Stern. Yeah. Anyway, the last night show was Shangri-La. You've got to go see that. Beautiful singing. Um, I heard the Wiccan one was very good. But Wiccan was wild. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my mother's lesbian Wiccan wedding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jewish, right? Jewish lesbian Wiccan wedding. Anyway, so there, there's support out there, in my opinion. Yeah. Good, thanks. This may be outside of what you, uh, it's separate from this, but I noticed in one of the vision plans, as you pointed out, there's a theater, movie theater and a live theater. Uh, do you know anything about the economics of uh, movie theaters these days? I don't, but I just hear like this summer yeah. the box I think office is. King getting... Lear has done some research on that. I mean, more art house kind of, not not yeah. compete. I mean, we're going to have another you know, multiplex yeah. Yeah, right now in San Antonio yeah. Yeah. very soon. So I, I yeah, I think it's kind of a uniqueness of experience. I mean, there's so there, there's so much competition within the movie space right now from people being able to just see it on their own, but but also the, what went over on Shoreline now is redone it so you basically sleep while you're watching the film or whatever, they've redone their thing. You know, so so what within this community and the size, and, and, and it seems like what this community responds well to are um, uh, relatively small, local, nice, upscale, but, but within a certain kind of parameters, not into a kind of big, huge, uh, over-the-top experience. So how does that translate into a, to a movie theater and what type of programming? Mm -hmm. John, has a question. So at one point in time, we had 18 acres, I guess we still do, and there was a vision of the civic center and right. community and involvement. And in the last six months, we are moving to abandonment. Um, we're downsizing, or at least the economics seems to have us downsize our community center. The library is considering moving downtown uh, and ups, upscaling, upsizing. You guys want to move downtown and upsize. Um, uh, we've got the downtown where people are saying we need to downsize our downtown. Um, and I, I'm not going to voice an opinion because I'm not sure I have one, but I find it curious because we've gone from this notion of building a civic center which serves lots of purposes to sort of pushing everything or potentially pushing everything downtown or maybe elsewhere or making it go away. and. Any thoughts on that? It's, it's just it's it's a very much a reversal of where we were five or ten or twenty years ago yeah. as a community. Yeah, I mean each each approach has different strengths and weaknesses to it. Uh, as far as trying to centralize stuff into a community center and bring all the experiences into to, to one place and expecting the population to kind of go to that area and consume those experiences within that versus placing the experiences adjacent to other things that they're already interacting with. And, trying to leverage experiences to the benefit of other things within the downtown. Placing, having a theater over in the community center definitely um, kind of heightens its kind of community connection. It's about supporting and servicing the community connection to the library and the way that people interact with that. But primarily, if you think about it, most people interact with the community center during the day. They don't interact with the community center as it's constructed now um, at night other than um, the people coming to the theater or, or renting the museum you know, for weddings yeah. <laughs> and a few yeah. plus things. That's another really um, interesting conflict. But we do have a, a downtown that is has desires uh, to, to bring more people to interact with those things that it's providing that are about people interacting with it downtown. Um, but there isn't other than coming to, to go to a restaurant, there aren't other really experiences to, to drive people to the place that then can have a different economic impact for the city. So. Um, both have benefits. The I, I I would say that if you were going to build a theater, you know, just off the top and not there wasn't anything existing, and you were looking at it, would you say, oh, let's build it in the community center, or let's build it uh, adjacent to the restaurants in the downtown area that people were doing? Probably the first impulse would be, oh, we can choose. Let's just, let's build it adjacent to the businesses and the things that are right there, so people can park, go to dinner, go to the theater. Walk we just have a couple minutes. So, Mary, you had a comment. Yeah, I did a question actually. And first of all, I apologize for being late, but I have a pre commitment at the History Museum for a realtor speech. We've got out early, so I'm okay. happy to be able to be here at all. But um, 
I just wondered if either of you have experience with anybody who has done the combination of live theater and movie theater, any community yeah. that you're aware of. Um, I, I think uh, not not as a design, not as a uh, okay. before the building is built. It's been more of a thing that people have integrated into an existing space or have built centers that have both a theater and a space within the complex of a the center. theater. Yeah. A screen yeah. room within. Right. Right. Um, Thank you. Thank you. And just to comment also about the changes, you know, that the millennials like experience is not things. And and so we change as we see yeah. what's going on around us. And we've got a couple more businesses that close this week. They're not going to, I mean, that's going to continue if anybody looks at what's going on in retailing. So if we want an active downtown, these are the sorts of things we have to talk about in my opinion. I mean, 20 years ago, we started out thinking, how can we fix up this crummy little old uh, metal building? You know, and we did. We got grants and put in insulation and heating and cooling and things like that. That was 20 years ago. That's all needs to be replaced. So how many times do you fix up a structure that really can't be? It's a quantity. Yeah. <laughs> right. We're out of time. Thank you very much. I'm just going to answer Mary's question. Uh, there is an example, Mary, in Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> Okay. They, they, you know, it's primary, It's more a theater, but the library also has use of it. But it's really more of a theater, and it's begins with an M. I'll look it up and send it to you. Okay, I'll look.